to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel the of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of and Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Have you ever had someone ask you, what's the difference between the Church of Christ and other religious groups? We're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. We're going to think about what the Bible says the difference is between the Church of the New Testament, the church you read about in the Bible, and so many other religious groups today. We hope that you'll get your Bible and have it handy as we're going to study this subject from the Word of God. And friend, we want you to know that we're so glad that you've joined us for our lesson today. Uh, we hope you'll visit our website where there is a host of Bible study material. That website address is thegospelofchrist.com. We have free DVDs, free CDs. We've got studies on every book in the New and Old Testament that are available free of charge and a host of topical studies as well. You can get those free of charge. You can write to us or call us or email us. We'd be glad to help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, as we think today about this subject, what's the difference between the church of the Bible, the church that Jesus established, and many religious groups that exist today, please understand that we're not saying that we are the only, that Christians, that those who are members of the Lord's church are the only sincere people. There are people who are very sincere. They may have a zeal for God, as Paul said in Romans 10, 1 and 2, but not according to knowledge. We're not saying that we're the only ones who are honest or that we're the only ones who are true and that we're trying to, only ones who are trying to seek right. That's not the idea. But friend, what we are saying is there's a right way. There's God's way. There's the church that Jesus built, the one church, and many are not following that teaching. Anybody who will go to the Bible, here's what we're saying today. Anyone who will go to the Bible with an honest heart, seek to do the will of God, can know the truth, John 8 verse 32, that truth is the Word of God, John 17, 17, 17, and can know that they're right with God, but you've got to approach the Bible with the attitude, I'm going to only do what the Word of God says. And so we mentioned to you today what some of the significant differences are in the Lord's church and modern denominations that exist in our world today. What's one of the major differences? Friend, one of the first and most glaring differences between the Lord's church, the church of Christ, and denominations today is this. The structure of authority that the New Testament church follows is completely different. Here's what I mean by structure of authority. In the church of the Bible, there are no earthly headquarters from which we are getting doctrine or from which we are being told what to say and to teach and how to think and how to act. The Lord's church has headquarters and they're in heaven itself, emanating from the throne of God and the doctrines of God are found in the Bible. Jesus is the head of the church, Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23. And friend, Jesus is at the right hand of the throne of God today. Matthew 16, verse 19, Jesus said to Peter, I'm going to give to you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will already be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will already be loosed in heaven. God has already decided and the headquarters of the church are located in heaven where God and where Jesus, the head of the church, is at. And so we're not looking to Rome, Italy. We're not looking to Springfield, Missouri. We're not looking to Salt Lake City or, or Jerusalem or some other geographical location on a map from which we believe all doctrine and teaching and things like that emanate from. They come from the throne of God, from Jesus, the head of the church, and from heaven itself. 
Friend, we also realize as we think about the structure of the New Testament church, not only is there not an earthly headquarters, there's no regional office that's going to determine doctrine or practices or, or programs or, or has authority over local congregations and things like unto that. We're not looking to some local office or regional office. Again, the matters of doctrine uh, from the Scripture have been decided already. Here's what's great. Psalm 119 verse 89 says this, Forever, O Lord, Your Word is settled in heaven. We do not need a group of fallible men at some convention somewhere to get together and decide this is what we believe or this is not what we believe. Why don't we need that? God's Word's already been settled. The matter was, matter was settled when Jesus and the apostles and the inspired writers spoke it and God gave us the Bible for that reason. God gave us the Bible so that we could know the truth and know how to live. 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. And friend, here's the good news today. I'm not looking for any new doctrine or new ideas or things like that. 2 Peter 1 verse 3 at the close of the New Testament says this, God has given to us all things for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called it. We have everything we need for life and godliness through the words of the Bible. And thus the Bible is our final authority and Jesus is still the head of the church. And so our structure is different in that we recognize heaven is the headquarters. There is no local or regional office dictating what we can and cannot do. God's Word's already settled. And thirdly, in the Lord's church, there's not going to be a convention, not going to be a, a, a gathering of men or women to vote on beliefs and policies. Friend, we've already got that settled in the Bible. There's no need for men to get together and decide on that. Again, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17 says this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Does the Bible claim that it can thoroughly equip, can give us everything we need, make us complete, and equip us to do God's will? Absolutely. Then why do I need, why would anybody need to vote or decide if we're going to believe and teach certain things? God's already decided that matter. And remember, the Bible says God cannot lie. Hebrews 6, 18, and this book, you know, some people say, well, the, the Bible's a, an old, archaic book that's out of touch. That's not what the Bible says. This book is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. This book is as alive, powerful, and as relevant as the day the words came out the mouth of the Lord or His disciples, and it gives us direction on what we're to do and how we're to act. You know what else is unique about the structure of the Lord's church as it relates to authority. For in each congregation of the Lord's people is autonomous and self-governed. That means there, there isn't some mother church, as it were, telling all these little churches what to do. I, I've seen that, and you probably have as well. In some big city, there may be what some view as the, the, the mother church or the, the top diocese, and then it dictates to all these smaller congregations or different congregations what they're going to do and their policies and how they run things and, and who the preacher... Wait a minute now. In the Bible, in the Lord's church, each congregation is autonomously, autonomously governed by the Bible and the local set of leaders that God puts in place through the Word of God known as elders and as deacons. You see in Acts 14 verse 23, Paul told the churches in that area to appoint elders in every congregation. Acts 20 verse 28, they were to feed, to, to lead, and to shepherd, and to watch out for the church of God. Titus 1 verse 5, Paul told Titus that his responsibility in preaching the gospel was to appoint elders in every city, a congregation in every city. So in every city, they would have a set of elders in that congregation as well. And so every congregation is to have elders. Uh, they're to be the spiritual leaders of that congregation, and there isn't to be 
some big me and little you or, or some hierarchy or somebody who's higher up the chain, spirit. You don't find that in the Bible. No, that's not what we find in Scripture. All men stand on level ground at the foot of the cross. Heaven is the church's, or head, earthly, heaven is the church's headquarters. Uh, each congregation is governed by the Bible, and God has already decided what we're going to believe and teach. And friend, this is why all of this is so important. The Lord today is still the head of His church. We do not, don't miss this, we do not need some man to come in and try to seize the headship of the church because Jesus is still the head of His church, right? Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23, Jesus, God says, and He is the head of the church, which is the body. God gave Him authority over all things. Matthew 28, verse 18, He built the church, I will build my church, Jesus said, He founded that church, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. He died for it, Ephesians 5, verse 25. And friend, the church belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And God has set up the proper structure for authority. And that's what makes the Lord's church so unique. So, so refreshing to see that we're going by the Bible and we're letting God do what He wants in His church. But friend, not only do we recognize this, we think about the differences. Not only do we recognize that the structure of authority is different, we also realize that the source of authority is different in the Lord's church. Friend, in many religious organizations today, there are liturgies, there are creed books, there are manuals of doctrine, there are confessions of faith that those groups practice and promote and that they would tell their members, this is what we believe and teach, and, and many of the people who lead that follow those things. Friend, in the Lord's church, there's no creed books, there's no manuals, there's no confessions of faith that state what the church is to believe or is not to believe or, or things like under that. When you think about creed books, I, I often think about this idea. If, if, a, if a doctrine, if a book contains more than the Word of God, it's too much. If it contains less than the Word of God, it's too little. If it contains the same as the Word of God, why do we need it? You think about that. If, if some book man writes contains more than the Word of God, Hey, that's too much. I don't need that. If it contains less than the Word of God, that's not enough. That's not what the Bible says. If it's the same, why do you need it? That's why God gave us the Bible. And friend, when we think about not having creeds and confessions of faith, we don't need that because we've got everything we need right here. Isn't it wonderful to know that God gave us this book and it's everything I need to get to heaven? That's what the Bible says. These things we've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Why did God give us the Bible? So I can know, not wonder, not think, not best guess, not, well, I'm pretty sure. God gave us the Bible so that we can know we're right with God. Psalm 119, 160, the entirety of God's Word, this book, is truth. And thus, we must only speak as the oracles of God. If someone know what, what do we believe on this practice? How do we feel about this idea? We're not going to turn to a confession of faith and say, Article 12, point number 3, this is what somebody... Some, no. Let's open the Bible and see. Let's see what God has to say on this matter. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that idea refreshing to know? We believe that our only source of authority is the Scripture. Friend, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ looks to the Bible for God's Word, for its beliefs, and all of its practices. I want you to think about these questions that occur in Scripture that illustrate this idea. In Jeremiah 37, verse 17, in the long ago, a great question was asked that we need to be asking today. Is there any word from the Lord on, on practice, on doctrine, on belief, on the functionality of the church? What's the question we ought to ask? What page in our creed book does it say that? No. Is there any word from the Lord on this matter? 
Or in the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, what does the Scripture say? And that's a great question. What does God say? Well, let's look. It wouldn't it be great if more people just said, instead of, you know, this is what history says, or, or, or this is what men th reason says, or this is what men throughout the centuries have done, or, or this is what it says in our... No. What does the Scripture say? That's refreshing. That's great to know that we can just go to the Bible and do exactly what God says. And friend, it's so good to know that you can know God's will and you can do it. Isn't that wonderful? Psalm 119, verses 10 through 12. How can a man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word with your whole heart. With my whole heart I've sought you. Let me not, let me not depart from your statutes. Your word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. I can know God's will. I can search it. I can see that to be true. And how I love the words of John chapter 8, verse 32. Jesus said this, you can know the truth. You shall know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Well, someone says, okay, what's truth? Jesus answered that. John 17, 17. Sanctify them by your truth, he prayed to the Father. Your word is truth. If God's word is truth, and if Jesus said we can know the truth, and the truth will make us free, and friend, I need to put the emphasis as our source of authority on the Bible. This is what's unique about the Lord's church. We strive to say and to do only what God tells us to. Jesus said in John 12, verse 48, He who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Why do we need to put such an emphasis on the Bible as our only source of authority? A well, friend, simply put, it's going to be that which judges us. When I stand before God, I'm not going to give an account for the books of men. I'm not going to give an account for the doctrines of men. I'm not going to be judged by what some liturgy or confession of faith or, or, or articles of court. No, I'm not going to be judged by that. I'm going to be judged by the Word of God. I need to put the emphasis on the Bible as our source of authority because it's the gospel that has the power to save people. It's the Word of God that can save our souls. James 1.21, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. This is why, this is why Paul said, study to show yourself approved unto God. This is why Paul told Timothy, preach the word, not man's ideas, preach the word. There are many who've got itching ears who want you to teach other things. And Paul said, Timothy, you need to preach the word of God. That's what really matters in this day and age. And so the structure of authority is unique and different and refreshing in the Lord's church. Our source of authority. It's so wonderful to know that we only go by the Bible to do those things. And then, friend, as we think about what are the differences between the Lord's church and denominations today, friend, the name that the Lord's church wears is also different. The term Church of Christ, Lord's church, church of God, these are our descriptions of ownership. These designate and, 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 and give glory to God and to Jesus as the owner, the one who died for the church, the one who bought it, the one who purchased it, the one who built it. We want the church in every way to bring honor and glory to God. You see, these are biblical names. Romans 16, 16, Paul said, Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. That, that's the designations that we find in the Bible. Uh, 2 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians 1, verses 1 and 2. The to, the, to the Corinthians, Paul would say, the church of God at Corinth. Church of Christ, church of God, church of the Lord, church of the firstborn. Those are all designations, uh, descriptions that show the ownership of the church belongs to God. And friend, that's rightly so. For Jesus said it this way in Matthew 16, verse 18. Jesus said to Peter, who had just made that, that wonderful confession, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to Peter, You're Simon Barjona, uh, flesh and blood's not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then Jesus said this, And I say to you that you are Peter. You're a small stone. And on this rock, this bedrock foundation, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Friend, who does the church belong to? Jesus said, I'll build my church. Who built the church? Jesus did. If Jesus died for it, 
Acts 20 verse 28, he purchased the church with his own blood. If he built it, if it belongs to Christ, then shouldn't it have a description that the Bible gives and that honors God and Christ and the Scriptures? That's why we go by the names that are only found in the Bible. You see, the church, it owes its allegiance to Jesus. He purchased it, Acts 20, verse 28. The church shouldn't be governed by, by humans. It ought not to be named by men or, or methods or forms of government. In the Scripture, people tried that, and the Holy Spirit said that wasn't right. Did you know that denominational names, naming it after another, besides Christ, was actually tried in the New Testament and God condemned it? Uh, let me illustrate for you. Open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I want you to notice what the Scripture will say about this idea of, of following men and being followers of other men and what God says about that. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I want you to notice what the Scripture says beginning in verse number 10. Paul says, And I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Paul says, now I say this, each of you says, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Well, what's going on here in Corinth? Well, you've got people who are, are close to Paul or Cephas or Apollos. And so if they were asked, are you a part of the one church? They'd probably say, yeah, we're just the sect. We follow Paul. We're followers of Cephas. I'm of Paul. I'm of Cephas. I'm of, I'm of Apollos. How did God feel about that then? God said, let there be no divisions among you. What about today? When people say, I am of Grace, or I am of John Wesley, or I am of Martin Luther, or I am of John Calvin, let there be no divisions among you. People tried to divide over men and follow after their names in the New Testament. And God said, don't do that. And so the church that you read about in the Bible, it's unique because the designations that we wear in Scripture are completely different than what we find in the world today. Friend, as you think about the church, please understand, all we're trying to do is to point men and women back to the New Testament. We're trying to help people go back to the Bible and the Bible alone. As we think about uh, our source of authority, friend, we want people to see from the Scripture. Hey, you don't have to go through anybody but Jesus Christ to be saved. He's the door, John chapter 10. He's the way. He's the truth and the life, John 14, 6. I don't have to go to some man and say, Father, forgive me. I don't have to look to a, a priest or a pastor somewhere to say, you know, what do, you know, tell me what I've got to do to be saved. Someone might could point you toward the Bible, but those men aren't going to save you. They're not our source of authority. The Lord Jesus Christ is the authority. We go through Him and we follow His will. We want to point people back to the Bible because the Bible is the only, going to the Bible and the Bible alone, that's the only way men and women are going to be saved today. This book has everything we need for life and godliness. And friend, if we're going to go by the Bible and the Bible only, then let's call the church what Jesus called it, my church. Let's call the church what God called it, the church of God, church of the firstborn. Let's do things in Bible ways and just go by what the Bible says. And so I hope you can see today how refreshing the idea of the New Testament church is, how unique and how, how different and how that stands out from the crowd because it's just trying to be. Here's all that Christians today are trying to be. We're trying to be today what they were in the first century. We have the same word they've got. We follow the same Savior they followed. We've got the same plan that was laid out for them. Why can't we today just be Christians? Nothing more, not hyphenated, not a Christian plus, 
just Christians, nothing more, nothing less, just members of the church that our Lord and Savior died for. Maybe you want to be a member of that church, but you don't know how. Friend, the Bible teaches us how to become a member of the Lord's church. On the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and he, for the first time, preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he preached Jesus as Lord. Acts 2 verse 36, Peter said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. They heard the message of salvation. They heard that Jesus was the Savior of the world and, and, and they believed that message. For the Bible says in Acts 2 verse 37, they were pricked in their heart. They realized we've sinned. We've killed the Messiah. We believe now He is the Savior. What did they need to do next? Once they'd heard that message and believed, Peter told them to repent. Acts 2 verse 38, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Peter told them they've got to change their life. And friend, if someone's going to become a Christian, you've got to turn from sin and turn to God. Acts 3 verse 19, Peter later said, Repent and turn that your sins may be blotted out. And yes, the Bible teaches, the New Testament teaches, Jesus taught that to be saved, to be a member of His church, you must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus so plainly said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. And friend, here's the good news. What we see from Acts 2 is that those who gladly received His Word and were baptized, Acts 2 verse 42 and 30, 43, the Bible says in verse 47 that the Lord added them to His church. Men didn't vote on it. Men didn't have to approve it. When people in the New Testament obeyed the gospel, God added them to His church, and they were a part of the Lord's church wherever they went. And so we beg you today to think about what we read in the New Testament, about the church, about God's plan of salvation, uh, uh, about getting away from man-made ideas, and just becoming a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less. May God help each of us to study these matters, to look to the Word of God, and make up our mind to just be a Christian, a follower of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at one 855 Four five eight three nine zero five, or write to us at P.O. Box seven eight eight, McMinnville, Tennessee three seven one one one.